Hello everybody and welcome to another Project Egg interview. Today we are talking to Parul Gujral, who is a man of the world and cannot be pinned down to any single location. How you doing today, Parul? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And I have to say, San Francisco is home base and I've been fortunate to be here for the last month and a half consistently. That's but indeed, yes, been fortunate to travel often. That's amazing that a month and a half is consistently being in one place. That's awesome. So let's jump right in. Parul, what is your story? My story? Great question. Where do I start? Where do I end? It's ongoing still, fortunately. Um, specifically in regards to Snowball or myself personally? Uh, from the very beginning. Inclu everything. It's all, all relevant. Sure. So maybe I'll get started with you know, how my family came to the United States and what the inspiration of Snowball was. And so I have an uncle, his name is Uncle Sarwan, and he came from a small village in India outside of um, Punjab area. And for generations, him and his family had been farmers. And he was the oldest of 13 in a farming village as a farmer who had a dream to live a better life. And this dream, he decided to act upon in the form of this Hail Mary application to UC Berkeley. And so, lo and behold, he got in. But how does a farmer boy, oldest of 13, who's, been, who's come from a farming village of generations of farmers, afford to go to university, let alone university on the other side of the world, um, UC Berkeley? And so, a thousand villagers plus gave their life savings to Uncle Sarvan to be able to come to UC Berkeley with the hopes that you know, he would be able to transpire a better life for their kids and generations in the village to come. And so um, Uncle Sarwan had just gotten married to my aunt, my oldest aunt, my dad's side, and lo and behold, he was here at UC Berkeley. And he got an internship at a water engineering company, which um, he just retired from five years ago. He brought my whole family over here. And that's the opportunity of, of the American dream that I've had the, you know, the, the unique I guess, um, opportunity to realize. And so, um, so I was born in India and I came here quite early on. I think I was like between six and eight months old. And, um, I've been very fortunate to be traveling quite often, uh, specifically back to India, um, uh, my whole life and being in San Francisco, I've been working in tech for the last 10 years and having leadership positions and startups. Um, I've been very fortunate to travel across the world, open, um, open markets up and, yeah, I realize that the world is flat. Um, but that actually goes into the inception story of Snowball. How did Snowball get started? So my uncle being retired, I realized rarely would go out and have enjoy enjoy a fancy dinner. And so I was one day, I have a very profound memory asking Uncle Sarvan, why don't you go, you know, treat yourself to a fancy dinner? It's, you know, pennies of what your disposable income is. And Uncle Sarvan said, son, why would I spend $200 on dinner when I could feed a village? And so Uncle Sarvan is extremely a noble gentleman. He's philanthropic and he's really inspired my life mission, which is to positively affect the lives of as many humans as possible. And I've done that um, in all the endeavors that I've um, embarked upon, including the, philanthrop the philanthropic endeavors, which I'm currently working on on the side, as well as Snowball. And so this brings me to Snowball, right? What is Snowball? Why Snowball? How did we get here? So I've been trading um, cryptocurrencies since 2016, late, late, late 2015, early-ish 2016. Um, and I say trading because if I had, had I been investing, I'd probably be have a nicer view. <laughs> um, but with that said, I became a thought leader within my own circle. And I remember profoundly, uh, a, a very vivid memory of a day that my uncle Sarvan called and said, son, um, how do I invest in this Bitcoin? I was like, uncle, I think you mean Bitcoin um, or like a portfolio of, of diverse crypto assets, digital assets. And this was, this was a unique um, moment because my uncle is one of the most risk adverse individuals you'd ever meet. I mean, he rather donate 200 bucks to a village and feed them than even spend $200 on dinner. And so he doesn't believe in investing in, in stocks because the stock market is going to crash. 
Um, if he does, he's in and out very quickly. He invests in like 401ks and bonds because those are the safest investments. So how does someone who's so extremely risk adverse come up with the idea to invest in perhaps the most volatile asset class? And I realize there's millions and millions of uncles out there that have no idea how to invest in these currencies, um, but may want to for, for many reasons. Um, and this comes from the fundamental thesis that once money goes fully digital, will it ever go back? And I really want you to think about this, Ben. When money goes fully digital, will it ever go back? And I think where you start is what was, where was money born? How was it born, right? We came from a bartering system. Here's my sheep for your rice. And then we evolved to some sort of scarce asset class um, in the form of, let's just say the form of gold, silver, copper, since that was the most recently popular one. And from there, we took a fiat or cash currency and put it in front of this gold. And we put the gold in the bank. And so we got rid of the gold standard in the bank and then had a, a legal tender note, which is promise, a promissory note by the government, which in so many words is the government and the military promises that will, this note will retain value. And from there, we've evolved to using checkbooks. And so now you could print up any amount of, uh, any number of value based off of, you know, the promise that that cash is held in the bank. Um, and today we live in the world of not only credit cards, but Apple Pay, Venmo, PayPal. And if you're to start a bank account, and I, I embarked upon a journey once upon a time in starting a bank and, and spent a lot of time researching this. And one of the, the learnings um, were that a bank traditionally lends out up to 10x of the amount of capital that they ever have, right? So money is already digital. And if money has been evolving since its inception, wouldn't it be hyper rational for it continue to evolve if there's a new form which solves many of these problems that we're you know, experiencing today? If I want to send money to my family in India. Well, it's going to take days. There's going to be enormous amount of fees. And God forbid I do it over the weekend, right? Because then I have to wait till a business day and time for the transaction to clear. And so we, we strongly believe that digital currencies are here to stay, whether the market sentiment is high or low. Um, and so, um, and people are going to get it, come into this space. And what we saw with the whole ICO craze was many people lost their shirt, their theft and scams were rampant. The folks who were trying to do the right thing, I think there was a statistic that said 40% of ICOs ran out of money within four months. So even if they're aspiring to do the right thing, they don't have the right business acumen. And so, um, you know, we wanted to make it as easy and as safe as possible for folks to enter this asset class. Um, and if they are going to opt to invest in cryptocurrencies, um, we would say only invest what you're willing to lose. Um, the upside is, is great, that, so you can't dismiss it. And we have um, endowments like Yale and Stanford and Harvard that are making investments and saying, suggesting that one should put up to 6% of their assets into cryptocurrencies because not only do you have limited drawdowns, um, you have risk adjusted return because there's lack of correlation to the stock market, gold, bonds. Um, and I can go on to this thought forever. So maybe I'll let you get a word in. So let's jump back into your childhood. And, and I want to talk, I want to talk finance. Believe me, I do. But, <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about your childhood first. Sure. I believe you said that you came over to the United States when you were about six to eight months old. That's right. What was your life like when you got here, and sure. how do you think that shaped you as an individual? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, my father, my parents, they, when they got started with uh, a print shop in India where they were having a book publishing company, and they would publish all sorts of different children's books. And when they came to the U.S., um, like a lot of Indians, um, the directions they go, there's a, an abundance of community and the community helps each other out. And the community that we were grandfathered into was like the convenience store, gas station community. So my father started, you know, we were living at our uncle's house. He started working at a gas station. He bought a gas station, went into you know, investing in real estate. Um, but I, I had the unique, um, I guess, learning of my father who worked harder than anyone I've ever met, you know, at work before I wake up, comes home after I'm asleep. And 
usually juggling many different entrepreneurial activities. Um, and I saw the high highs and the low lows, um, but having that type of exposure um, really gave me this vision that was grandiose of you know, transpiring uh, the golden handcuffs of mediocrity and, and doing something much bigger than myself. And so this is why we transpired like this vision into a business which is only going to be successful if we think if we're able to make a difference in the world. And for us, the difference is giving folks exposure to cryptocurrencies in the most safest for a long term, what we believe to be as safe long term investment as possible. And so we can't make a killer business without um, changing the world or making a dent in the world. And we can't make a dent in the world without making a killer difference such that our, our values are married with our success. It seems like you, you were saying that you came from a very entrepreneurial background. Your uncle has this amazing story of rallying the entire community behind him and, and your parents are doing entrepreneurial things. So you're seeing all this as you're growing up. And, and that in and of itself probably had some influence on you. But did you ever talk about that stuff with them? Were there conversations around the dinner table or, or wherever conversations were had in your home about these kinds of things? Like what what would y'all talk about in regards to this stuff? Oh, yeah. I mean, I literally was raised inside the convenience store, right, for 10, 12 hours a day, nights, weekends. Um, I was raised in you know buying real estate and being walking through and renovating houses. Um, I was raised by going, my, my dad was an extremely noble man as well, it is a noble man, helping all of his friends and peers out that have come from India that you know, don't have um, like the business acumen that he has or aren't as educated. And so you know, when someone's getting audited you know, by, by the IRS, and my dad is there to support them, I'm sitting at the table watching the conversations go by. When my dad's negotiating a deal, when he's doing all the accounting, when he's doing the forecasting, when he's moving across the country, I got great exposure of you know embarking upon opportunities that you are otherwise not so familiar with, but bringing a, a decent head on your shoulder, having great advisors, asking good questions, um, and realizing that success leaves clues. And so um, I went the opposite direction as my brother, right, by being an entrepreneur working in the startup tech seen my brother he's gone he's been at wells fargo for about 14 years right i'm over here saying long bitcoin short the bankers while whilst he's a banker um and he's gone through a predictable successful way where he's got a ladder and he's doing quite well um but for me it's it's not necessarily about <clears throat> gucci belts or success i that that's not something that i find any value or happiness and i what's really exciting to me is making a significant difference and helping people out because when you're helping someone out, or at least you believe that you're helping someone out, there's no anger, there's no fear, there's no angst, it's just fulfillment. Um, and so I, before we started Snowball, I defined success as getting an email or getting a tweet or a handwritten letter saying thank you for you know, helping me send my child to school or helping me buy my first house or helping me have this life savings, et cetera. And so um, that's really what the vision is. As you're growing up and you're doing a lot of traveling, mm -hmm. how did that shape your identity of self, right? Because a lot of times we get very rooted in our community and we think, okay, this is where I'm from. This is who I, this is defines me, right? How did that traveling really shape your identity of self? Yeah, I think it's just a factor of perspective. Um, and especially when you are exposed to a third world country and the harsh reality of what the majority of the world goes through, you start having gratitude and appreciation for things as simple as the blue sky. Um, I remember how depressing it was to have long trips to India and New Delhi specifically because there's m more smog in New Delhi than any other city in the world, such that you cannot even see the blue sky. You cannot see clouds. People go their lives without experiencing that. Um, and I really hope that they do something about it. And ultimately, just like being able to even breathe fresh air is something that we take for granted. Um, and so it really comes down to perspective. 
uh, I had the opportunity to live in, in Paris as well and, and finished my school at the American Business School of Paris, um, which was you know, actually a, a very, it was an epiphany that I had. Um, it, was, it was perhaps the, the most fun time and most growing, at the time I grew the most in my life because for the first time I was you know, traveling my whole life is very different than actually living abroad. And for the first time, I had the opportunity to look through the eyes of a Parisian or Frenchman to see what it means to be American um, versus, you know, bringing Amer my American perspective to the rest of the world and comparing. Um, and that happens when you plant your seeds somewhere else and your roots somewhere else and you, you start to let go and decide to become the passenger as opposed to the driver. Um, and so bringing that back was, you know, a really incredible life-changing experience and I highly recommend everyone if they have the opportunity to live abroad um, to do so. You said you, you've you been in tech for I believe you said about 10 years now. Yes. What inspired your love for technology and how did you first get into that space? Oh man, I was a nerd growing up. I was building computers and writing code and yeah, I mean, this is what I did for fun. Um, I've just been a technology nerd my whole life. And so being here in San Francisco at Silicon Valley, you know, the, the motherland and the capital of innovation for the world, it's like it's like Disneyland for a tech geek like me. And so, you know, tr going through my career, I realized initially early on I was doing quite well. I was at a company called All Covered Selling Managed IT Services, and it was very unsexy and I was the number two person in the whole country um, I was the youngest person with my job title by like 20 years and I was managing you know 54 people over five offices in this program of selling managed IT services um, and I, I was doing quite well I was making exceptionally more than all of my peers and I was on this track you know, I had a great track record and I was on this trajectory I was a rookie of the year year one and I, I realized that you know I wanted to be on the forefront of innovation. I didn't want to be on the tail end. And so that's when I jumped off uh, head first um, into the tech scene and joined uh, a really early stage startup and that was going through the 500 startups program. And so I got to experience what it's like to go through a prestigious accelerator and go through insane amount of growth um, alongside you know, many peers that are going through the same process and have that collective community that's sharing their learnings, perpetuating each other forward. And then from there, I just transpire that into all of the other projects that I worked on, whether it be my own consulting of companies on growth hacking, um, whether it be, you know, I was a, a VP at a company called Engineer.ai, uh, which is software that builds software, so software development, helping people bring their ideas to life, giving birth to their ideas. I mean, that's a really profound, incredible, um, life-changing experience in itself, watching people go through that. Um, and actually being the being the individual who's helping drive that. And so, um, so many learnings through all these startup experiences and entrepreneurial experiences that when I've come to Snowball, um, the experience has been unlike any other because this isn't something that was based on ego. This isn't my idea. This isn't what I want for my own success, for my own significance, my feeling of connection. Um, this is an idea that the, the universe needed and wanted that I, I'm just the the instrument of. And so when I took this idea to the world, I realized that the world is full of these apex predators, right? If you go into the ocean, you have great white sharks in the form of VCs who are going to breach you. If you go into the, the jungle, you have the bears in the form of regulators that will maul you, right? And if you go to the mountains, you, you have the mountain lions in the form of customers that will claw you. But Every time you take this idea to these different places and to these different apex predators and your idea doesn't die, it evolves. And so we spent about seven months on finding product market fit, evolving our idea. And I have to say there's nothing more frustrating when you're when you have you know minimal money in the bank and you're trying to get your your feet planted and you want to etch this in stone very badly. But we were extremely patient and diligent through the process. Um, and went through the product market fit, which is the reason why we've been able to make such a bang in the, in the industry after publicly unveiling ourselves just three months ago. Right? We've got 50,000 people on our wait list um, in a bear market, 
right, a bear market that's existed for 12 months. When Bitcoin went from 6,000 to 3,100, we had 10,000 people on our wait list. Um, and we're hyper connected with our team. We're hyper connected with our community and our wait list is growing like wildfire. Um, and I'm sure you may have seen that we were recently in Forbes for the third time. Um, I speak on podcasts and I speak in uh, all over the world and these different conferences. And we were on Thrive Global and we have many other publications that are writing about us that will have something in the near future. But um, I think that if you give the world something that it wants, then you know, you just have to make sure that you're doing the right thing through the process and and growth is inevitable. When you're talking about how you started in, in in a situation where you were working with companies, right? You you were the number two salesperson of managed IT, I believe you were saying. Yep. You were the VP at a different company and you were driving growth in all of these different places and it seems like you kind of left a trail of whatever the opposite of destruction is, right? Like a proliferation behind you as, as you were going through. Yeah. What was the key to achieving those things? Like how did you execute to the point where you were so successful in those different roles? Um, one simple factor, and that is success leaves clues, right? So find out, define your goal with absolute clarity, create a timeline, and then find someone who's done it and then essentially do what they do. And if you have a decent head on your shoulders and you have a little bit of luck then you're likely and, and, and an incredible work ethic, then you're likely to repeat the results or get close to it. Um, and then once you make it your own, then you innovate and become creative and take it to the next level. So it really comes from establishing that foundation, having op absolute clarity, setting a timeline, um, and then learning from the best. And that's what we've done here at Snowball as well. So we've got incredible advisors. You know, One of our advisors, he was one of the founders of Singularity University. He's also advising Facebook. He's also advising Harvard Medical School. His name's Reese Jones. He's taken two companies to IPO, four companies to ICO. Um, and he speaks at conferences all around the world. I mean, the collective knowledge that this gentleman has in various different fields is just it's it's baffling and so we we've been getting so much value from him another one of our advisors was the first ceo of salesforce.com right now you have exposure to people who created a brand new category had trouble fundraising from like the smartest money um, and now it's literally changed the world and started and exited four banks and has a tremendous amount of technology experience um, and what i find is when i sit with these gentlemen over dinner the most successful people aren't the ones telling the stories, they're the ones listening and asking questions. There's no ego involved, right? They're constantly learning. And so um, I, I've always had, you know, with my, my previous significant others, challenges sitting down watching movies because I'm not learning anything, right? Like, let's put on a documentary, let's learn something, otherwise it's a waste of time. But, but with that said, I think that's like, that's that relentless drive of curiosity, um, to, that yearning to learn, um, and then not only learn, but apply. So, you know, if knowledge was power, then we'd all be billionaires with six packs of abs, but we're not. It's the action is power, right? And that's really the difference. When you're going out and you're finding these people that you want to work with, you, you want to have them come in and be advisors or some sort, some sort of strategic alliance, right? Sure. How do you go about identifying who it is exactly that you want to bring on mm -hmm. and how do you sell them on the vision? How do you articulate that vision to where they find it valuable to invest their time in your project and idea? You know, it's really interesting you asked this question because now we have a full-time team of nine people who have essentially been more or less asked to be good for nothing. And I say good for nothing because we're paying them almost nothing and they're doing incredible work. Um, and so it really comes down to purpose and culture. If what you're doing is bigger than yourself, then in the peaks and the valleys of entrepreneurship or being part of a early stage thriving startup, if it's bigger than yourself, then you're not gonna have to climb out of the holes, you'll be pulled out because it's not about you, right? 
And so I think we've been able to really genuinely paint that picture for folks that have joined our team. Um, there's been times where we've had to let go the smartest person in the room, the smartest, most talented person in the room, not because you know um, we couldn't afford them, but for the reason of they just weren't a culture fit, right? And everyone is here because they believe in something bigger than themselves. And that applies to our investors, that applies to um, our advisors, and our advisors and our team have the opportunity costs to, to make a quantum, well, uh, then, or at least our team has an opportunity cost of making a quantum of what they're making at Snowball at the moment, right? Our, our CTO, he is a serial entrepreneur. He sold a company. He ran product for Procter & Gamble. He's got gray hair. He's an expert. Um, my COO co-founder, he was a hedge fund manager for 12 years. Um, Stevie Cohen was one of his clients. And when he left to another firm, he brought Stevie Cohen with him. He started a Ripple Parrot Exchange, right? These guys, these guys have expertise. They've had a tremendous amount of success. So why snowball? Why you know, be good for nothing? Um, and it shows three things. One, it shows character. It shows um, dedication. Uh, and it shows belief in something bigger than yourself. And so um, I think everyone is here on, and is on the same page because they're not coming to get um, the carrot waved in front of them or feel significant. They're coming here to do work that's meaningful. Um, and they believe in the long-term vision of the company. And ultimately, I mean, we say this, our, our mission statement is to unravel global financial inequality. And we're doing that by democratizing access to information and the information's in the form of these portfolios that are curated by professionals. So if someone wants to play uh, in this world of digital assets, they don't have to create their own investment thesis. They don't have to move money across exchange accounts. They don't have to take custody of their own assets. They don't have to read these 45 page white papers or shake hands with people on the team um, or try to get access to information. They can invest passively like Warren Buffett wants you to invest, right? Warren Buffett talks about investing in the S&P 500 and he did this million dollar bet that the S&P 500 would outperform a series of a portfolio of hedge funds over a weighted period of 10 years. And not only did it outperform, but it did by 400%. And so we believe in index passive investing for many reasons. And so we're trying to mitigate that risk for everyone. And we believe in that as doing the right thing and that digital assets are here to stay because money is going is digital and it's not going back. You mentioned how when you're bringing a new idea to life, or, or a project or whatever it may be, how sure. you run into all of these different apex predators, right? Yeah. And, I, and I believe, I love that term by the way, I believe what you said was, if you can survive meeting them, yeah, then you can slowly move into a period of iterating and developing, right? My question is, how do you survive that face to face with an apex predator. Sure, sure. Well, it's it's hard, but you have to go into this without any ego, right? So, um, in in entrepreneurship in the valley, they say fail fast, which means if you don't win, fail fast and test it out as fast as possible. And a big challenge with a lot of companies is they fail to find product market fit. They go and and they take their small um, there's their minimum working capital and they spend it on all of these marketing activities and ultimately you they forget to realize that there's three types of customers there's your owned there's your earned and there's your purchased and most companies go straight to purchase and what happens is you start sparking flames um, you know trying to convert these people into paying users of your application and perhaps they do but they churn and your purchase are the most expensive to uh, retain, they're the most expensive to acquire, and they're the first ones to label your company as something that it's not or leave some, you know, some note on a, Reddit, a subreddit form. And so the way that we've done it is by going after our owned. So that's our first 100. Our owned is gonna start with our friends and family, it's gonna start with our peer group, it's gonna start with our community, it's gonna start with our investors, it's gonna start with our partners. Um, and that's your first 100 customers. And the way that you get in front of them is very different than what you do with purchase. You actually interview them. You find out what their growing pains are. You get them to commit. If you build this product based off the pains that they're having today, 
will they commit to investing? Will they commit to using it? And you become a thought leader, you build their trust, you build rapport by going out and, and these different events and, and speaking engagements. And then once you understand who your owned is, then you go to your earned. These are the referrals from your owned. These are the people who are actually facing the problem that you're overcoming and solving through your solution. Um, and that's your first 1,000. And between your 100 and 1,000, once you get those folks um, signed up, activated, you actually have something called product market fit. You know exactly who your customer is. You know exactly what their problem is. So for us, we have a survey that has over 2,400 people have filled out. And that tells us how old our customer is, tells us where they live in the world, tells us how much money they want to invest in Snowball, tells us how frequently they want to invest. It tells us whether they even know what it means to be an accredited investor or not. It tells us if they've used any other robo-advisor services. It tells us uh, what their experience is in cryptocurrencies. It tells us how they found us. It tells us why they found us. Um, and then we also, we know what they don't like about us, right? So um, we gather all this information as much as possible. And so at that point, you've got the fire burning when you have product market fit. And when you get to the purchase, which is your 1,000 to 50,000 or 1,000 till perpetuity, is you've got the fire burning and you're putting gas on the fire. And so you can now have predictable growth. And that's the way that we've been doing this. Um, and it's been incredible. We've been able to attract some of you know the most talented folks to join our team. Our CMO, he's a celebrity. Uh, he has uh, 15 different Instagrams with his most prolific one is called millionaire underscore mentor, millionaire mentor, where he's offering these um, bite-sized nuggets of, of, of inspiration or philosophical, or not philosophical, but inspirational espresso, which people come to have every single day. Who are, and these folks tend to be entrepreneurs or wantrepreneurs. Um, and so people who are aspiring to, you know, to, to be able to enjoy their dreams and have them come to fruition and the people who are actually you know already in the process continuing to be motivated and so from there um, he's able to give them strategies on how to be successful and, and in some cases that may be snowball the snowball platform or cryptocurrencies or, or um, many different things but it's, it's really really exciting to be able to get people of, of that caliber to believe in us so much so that not only do they join our, our organization and start marketing us in their pre-existing marketing channels they have enormous amounts of opportunity cost but we also have a material amount of investment that's coming right so our first investor was a gentleman named richard blum um, and his wife is diane feinstein senator of california and so when he made that investment in us we we made a pledge that we're going to be doing everything uh, as legal as possible, right? And, and there's a pretty great, there's a very gray area when it comes to digital assets and regu regulations on what's legal and what's not. But we're going to be one of two companies that has a registered investment advisor that legally allows us to sell indices to non-accredited investors. Um, and we're already registered with FINRA, FinCEN, CFTC, et cetera, um, because when you're talking about other people's money, it's their livelihood. And so there should be regulation to ensure that you're doing the right thing. And so this is how we've built our infrastructure, our platform, um, and no part of the business plan has going to jail in it. So. I lost you there, Ben. I can't hear you. There we go. You, you talked about ego a couple times during the interview. And one of the things that I've noticed is that you've, done a great job of talking about how talented the team is um, but I'm I'm interested in in hearing about yourself as well so if you could maybe take a second to 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 talk about yourself in the in the uh, perspective of what skills and and strengths and superpowers are you bringing to the table so that you can push the stream forward so that you can build this dream team like why do they want to work with you what what are you bringing to the table sure sure so I've been asked before actually multiple times what is my superpower um, and what's actually been chosen for me um, this is my my attempt to be humble um, is my superpower is the ability to create a genuine relationship with anybody 
um, regardless of where you are in the world or what your financial status is or professional status is. Um, and I think one of our biggest values or, or my biggest value that I bring to the table is like you can't try to be genuine, right? You can't try to have integrity. You either have it or you don't. And people can smell it from a mile away if, if you're a phony. Um, and so I've been extremely genuine um, with my team and extremely honest um, such that it's really transpired into the culture. And I think that people truly feel like they're part of a family. They're part of something bigger than themselves. And it's easy for them to work nights and weekends because as a collective community, we're working together on this, this plan and purpose. And so um, building this culture is something that I've, I've come with a lot of experience in doing, and it's really transpired into the smiley faces that we have in the office. Maybe you might be able to catch some smiley faces over here. And Emily is our mastermind. She was at Yelp for six years, building community for Yelp. She was working for James Franco um, in Hollywood as um, a production manager, a writer, a production coordinator, and also an aspiring actor. And so we've got these incredibly talented people. And like Steve Jobs talks about, you know, you don't hire smart people to tell them what to do. You hire smart people so they tell you what to do. And so <clears throat> just really creating a framework and structure to ensure that there's a process where everyone feels empowered, regardless of what their title is, um, and everyone is owning their their division, and and because they they're owning it, they feel significant in what they're doing. That their work is actually making a material difference. We've talked a lot about how you've got here, but we haven't, and, and we've danced a little bit around what here actually is. But can you <laughs> can you talk about exactly what you're working on right now? exactly what snowball is and really give us a, an in-depth overview of what you are currently focused on sure sure so snowball snowball is the first smart crypto investment automation platform that empowers everyone to invest smart in crypto um, and what is a smart investment in crypto is investing like a professional would invest and so what we do is we've created these crypto indices that are inspired by regulatory compliant index funds. So think of like the Bitwises and the Coinbases of the world, the galaxies of the world. And the thesis is each one of these funds um, have these Ivy League grads that have done an enormous amount of research um, that are regulatory compliant, so they've registered with the financial governing bodies of the United States, and that they've put um, their own money, as well as have a fiduciary responsibility to the limited partners or their investors. Um, and if there's a minimum of $10 million into the index, then um, we've been able to weight a bit of the risk. And so uh, also fortunate to have um, Mike, co-founder, COO, as a former hedge fund manager to evolve on this investment thesis and transpire it into our own indices. And so we are the first uh, smart crypto investment automation platform. And you could think of us as like the Charles Schwab for digital assets or the wealth front for cryptocurrencies, uh, such that if you want to invest in cryptocurrencies for whatever reason, um, Snowball makes it very easy and safe to make smart investments. And we do that because by, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what it's like to invest in a portfolio of cryptocurrency your users are, but assuming that they're not, if you want to invest in a portfolio, you have to sign up for multiple exchanges. You need to move money from one exchange to another exchange. You need custody of your tokens on a hardware wallet so it doesn't get hacked. Like, you know, there's this in the news, there was an exchange out of Canada that had $190 million is now locked up because the founder of the exchange died and he had the private key. And so just the process is, it's meticulous, time consuming, it's, and it's risky because these exchanges are getting hacked all the time. And if you're like me, you have a bullseye on you where people are trying to not only hack into your account, but trying to sim jack you of your cell phone and get into your accounts that way. And so um, 
our goal is if you want to play in this world, we make it as easy and as safe and as simple as possible, applying um, a methodology that is renowned, that's well practiced, that some of the the financial leaders of the world, you know, preach, and that is index investing. Um, and so Snowball allows you to invest into these in, in indices. Um, and if you want to change from one index to another, um, you can do that. The minimal deposits are are small, and uh, Unlike most index funds, they're only available to accredited investors and they require a significant deposit. Snowball has a minimal deposit requirement and our goal is to be available to everyone. And so we're slowly um, letting this out to people on our wait list. Um, so if you want to be able to download the Snowball app, uh, there is a secret wait list at secret.snowball.money. That will put you on the wait list. If you want to download the app sooner than later, you can jump the line by sharing your customized link over the variety of social media platforms. And for every person that joins, you jump half the line. Um, and so we're advisor license from the really happy the government's back open again. <laughs> um, and, and we're a global thing to launch. Um, this quarter, and we're looking to launch America um, this year. And so we've we've created a buzz around the world. Uh, rolling. You've talked about some really incredible things that you are uh, that that you're working on, and it's easy to see how, especially with the social component, this has a very high likelihood of spreading and, and going viral and really attracting a, a large community. Mm -hmm. Where do you see yourself in the next 5, 10, 20 years? Sure. You know, our vision is, when we got started, is to create a platform that at least a quarter of the world could use. And so 5, 10, 20 years, I think that um, if you look at the amount of reserves, the capital reserves in developing nations, if that was just to go into digital assets, then you have a $10 trillion market. Um, and that's what, that's almost a hundred of where we're at today. Um, with the advent of a recession or depression in a developing or, or first world nation, you have the possibility of folks to find another asset class um, to move their money into, which is very likely and feasible for that to be digital currencies. Um, and so really what we're forecasting is you know, money is digital and it's never going to go back. And so we want to be a leader in this space, um, like, like a wealth front or a betterment or a Schwab or, we're, or a Fidelity or a Vanguard where we're a platform for different portfolios in, in and indices. And when ETFs are legal, then we'll be an index investing platform and we'll be a global company allowing everyone to put their assets um, and grow their assets through Snowball. Um, our vision is also to bring transparency. And so if you look at hedge funds, especially over the blockchain, they don't report, or pardon me, they report their gains and losses, but there's no transparency. And so our goal is, to bring transparency by uh, having them report all their trades on the blockchain. Um, and this way, if you're a new fund and you're doing quite well, well, you now have marketing exposure through Snowball by verifying your gains or losses. And if you're a big fund, you may want to get an LP, and the LP may require you to have some sort of third-party verification. And what that means for us is we'll be able to now make some pretty solid predictions of how the market is moving and allow retail and everyone to be able to participate in our own snowball index. Um, and I'm going to be making a bet at some point in the horizon. So, so it's a million dollar bet. So I would say keep your ear out for it. But we'll be making a, a pretty exciting million dollar bet. Um, and that's that's for another time. So I appreciate you sharing all of these different things. Um, and I and I know it's uh, it's exciting. Um, and I appreciate you going in depth on, on all of the, the specific points there. Um, I do have a few questions that are more you related and, and not as much snowball related. Sure. Um, what are you most afraid of? 
What am I most afraid of? Um, you know, I have kind of programmed myself over this last, gosh, however many years to not really focus on obstacles, but focus on solutions. So I'm a big believer that your quality of life isn't the quality of the events, but uh, a quality of three things. One is what you focus on. Is this the end or is this the beginning? Two, what meaning you give it. And based on the meaning you give it, what action you take. Um, and so um, my biggest fear would be that I'm encouraging folks to invest in this asset class and potentially the asset class goes away. I mean, it's my thesis that many of these tokens will go away. Um, but I'm very, very confident that digital assets are here to stay, and it's extremely unlikely. What does work-life balance mean to you? Well, if I'll share the cheesiest quote in the world, right? If you, you enjoy what you're doing, you're not working. And so um, you won't work a day in your life. Um, and I, I actually, I only share that because that's what we're embodying. Right? If you're passionate about what you're doing, then and you are balanced. Well, you're only imbalanced if you're seeking balance, right? So like we only want what we're not, right? People only want to be rich because in their eyes, they don't have money. They only want to be fit because in their eyes, they're out of shape. They only want to be happy because in their eyes are subconscious, they're uh, unhappy. And so I would say that if you're following what your passion and your purpose is, then you'll find balance native, you, natively. And so it's not something that necessarily needs to be worked on. But that's my perspective, and I could totally understand if, if everyone disagrees with me, and it's very skewed and subjective. So take it as noise or signal. How do you define wealth? Well, I think that wealth is happiness, right? And, and that's what we should all be chasing. And uh, there is a quote that was said that, uh, that I'm a huge fan of, by this gentleman named Mike Edelhart. He used to be part of, um, well, he's part of a company called Social Start Capital. Um, and he's extremely wise. I think he wrote like 23 books. But he said this quote, entrepreneurship is a form of socially accepted mania. And he says that because you believe that you could change the world and you have all odds against you. And if you look at this as, as a finance guy like me, uh, or a numbers guy, the probability of success is extremely low, let alone, I think there's a 0.086% chance of a company to be a unicorn if they get to their Series A of funding. And most companies die at seed. Um, and so if you have all the odds against you and it requires you to make these enormous life-changing sacrifices and crazy hours and lack of sleep and yada de do, right? Why would you wanna do that? Like a normal person would just wake up and get a job and find balance and, and, and find happiness in their growth. But um, for me, it's, it's something different. I think, you know, for me, the happiness and success isn't gonna be from what I have achieved in the future, but looking back of what I've achieved in the last two years and having a vision of doing more. I appreciate you indulging me in all these questions. Um, and, and I just have a few more for you. I really do appreciate sure. your time this far. Um, what makes you smile? What makes me smile? Um, two things, giving and gratitude. And so if you practice gratitude there and you practice giving when you give to someone, right? Unconditionally, not, not with any conditions of they give back. When you give to someone, there's no anger, there's no anxiety, there's no angst, there's no fear. It's just fulfillment. And it's not only a fulfillment of yours, but it's like that sense of community and sharing that fulfillment. And that's the same when you practice gratitude. And um, I think that like the, the one fact that I've realized that I've learned, regardless of who you are, live in the world, that really in, in my definition of what happy be is just one word, it's growth, right? It's not the light at the tunnel. It's not um, falling in love. People fall out of love. It's not, we all know material doesn't equate happiness. It's not like the six pack of abs, but it's those bite sized nuggets of success, right? It's, you know, oh wow, I lost one pound today. It's like, oh wow, I met this incredible person and now like we're doing all these unique, fun, exciting things, you know, or, you know, we're growing in our relationship and we've been together. Or it's, you know, my goal was to raise 
amount of money or get Y amount of customers or have X, you know, Z amount of users. And now we're able to do that. And I remember those days when I was getting my first 100 versus my 100,000 versus my first 1 million. And so as long as we're aspiring and pushing ourselves to grow in these various different parts of our life, I think we'll have fulfillment. And when you're not growing and you're stagnant, that's one of the most painful experiences. So again, so, I really appreciate you sharing all this. Two more questions for you. First is, what about yourself do you think is an important part of who you are that I did not ask you about today? In other words, what did I miss? Um, ben, we're having technical difficulties here. Can you repeat that again? Sure. Sure. What about yourself is an important part of who you are that I did not ask you about today? In other words, what did I miss? Um, an important about me, I mean, listen, you're interviewing me, but I'm just a team and a community and a group of people that are a collective consciousness. And I would say that, you know, back from how we started, that it's not being a human being, but a human becoming, we're constantly evolving. And so for me, it's not about what I've achieved or what we're achieving, but it's what our potential is and how we can get there together and what we can learn in the process. And so I guess I'll just leave you with that. So one more question for you. Um, and this one's a, a bit of a selfish question. So, uh, you know, I appreciate, uh, appreciate if you humor me on this one. Um, I'm 24, right? Building a couple businesses, have the show. I'm an, I'm an author, uh, doing a couple things. What should I be asking you that I wouldn't think to ask? So, hmm, what should you be asking that you wouldn't think to ask? I, I can't get into your brain and, and explore what's in there or what's not in there. But I think that, you know, what I've learned is, you know, when you go through these entrepreneurial endeavors for whatever reason I would ask yourself what your why is right and and whether it's an entrepreneurial endeavor or just a professional endeavor why why do you want that get to the root of it and then realize okay you've achieved that and what now right and if your why is so compelling that you can't live without this out then you know you're on the right road um, so I would, I would focus more on purpose-driven questions um, because we could always look at outcomes and celebrate outcomes, but as time progresses, um, sometimes they may not be repeatable. And, and if you focus on outcomes, you may miss like the Crocs, for example. Um, we ask all of these super successful CEOs of Microsoft and of Google, et cetera, like about yeah. this. But we all forget that every single morning there's a 9 out of 10 chance that a leader is waking up and doing something that's going to help their mental health, whether it's a form of meditation or breathing or working out or exercising. It's like a fundamental core thing that they all start. They don't typically don't start by looking at their emails if you look at like the people, the highest members of the world. So um, so I, I, would, I would really, you know, dig, dig deep on what the purpose is. And then from the purpose... Once you evaluate that, then you know what the significance of the rest of the topics are. Well, I, I appreciate well, I, that. I appreciate um, and, you know, Perul, I want to thank you so much well, for coming on the so interview much. today. It has been an absolute pleasure. And uh, to everybody who's listening, I want to thank you all. Um, Y'all are the reason that uh, – there's my Southern coming out. Y'all are the reason that we do this, and uh, yeah, I love you guys so much. And thank you so much for supporting the show and watching the show. Um, Y'all are the reason that, that I do this. So – Thank you so much, Parul. Do you want to uh, you want to wrap up for us? Yeah, absolutely. It was a pleasure to be on this show. So I invite everyone to go to www.snowball.money, or if you want to join our invite-only waitlist, go to secret.snowball.money. You can connect with us on Instagram. You can connect with us on Telegram. Um, we've got many ways to connect with us on Facebook. But get onto our waitlist. Give us a shout. Tell us what you think. DM me your questions. I'm happy to help you guys out in any way, shape, or form. Really grateful to be part of this opportunity. And, and cheers, guys. Let's all win together. All right. Have a great day, everybody. And thank you so much.